Building Canada's Indigenous Screen Office is part of the Dialogues program, and thank you to the Ontario Media Development Corporation for their support. Uh, just a few things, just please note there is no photography or recording in the studio. However, we are live streaming, so please do tweet and engage the social audiences that are tuning in. So thank you for respecting that as well. Uh, last year, we presented a session called Pathways and Protocols, Collaborating with Indigenous Communities, where we had a, included esteemed Inuk director, Zach Canuck, TIFF's Jesse Wente, Imaginative, and the New Zealand Film Commission. And in one short year later, Canada has created its own Indigenous screen office. Uh, led by Imaginatives uh, Marcia Nickerson and partners Valerie Creighton, CEO of the Canada Media Fund, and TIFF's own Danny Scoulet. This unstoppable trio took on the seemingly impossible and long overdue, and then did it. So how? Let's meet them. First up, Valerie Creighton. Valerie is the president and CEO of the Canada Media Fund, where she positions Canadian programming at the forefront of world markets. Sorry. <laughs> We're all mixed up back there. <laughs> uh, she was named one of 2016's 20 most powerful women in global television by The Hollywood Reporter. <laughs> uh, second is Dennis Goulet. Independent filmmaker, TIFF Shortcuts programmer. She is a Cree Métis writer-director. Her award-winning short films have screened at festivals all around the world, including Sundance, TIFF, Berlin. Um, and her most recent VR piece, The Hunt, was part of the incredible series 2167, Imagining Indigenous Life 150 Years into the Future. Welcome, Dennis. Marcia Nickerson, Chair of Imaginative Film and Media Arts Festival. A leader in, in, a leader in the field of indigenous governance, providing high level advisory services to indigenous, federal and provincial governments, indigenous organizations and other public sector clients. Welcome. And our chair for the session this afternoon is Giselle Gordon, independent media artist, film programmer, writer. She has uh, made over a dozen short films that have screened at TIFF, Sundance, Berlin, and is a longtime collaborator with pr prolific Cree artist Kent Monkman, with whom she's authoring a book. Please welcome to the stage all of our guests. Take it away. Hi, welcome everybody. Um, thanks for coming out today. So before we get started, I just wanted to give a tiny bit of context. Now, bear with me if uh, all of this is very familiar, but um, because we're also speaking to an international audience, I just want to make sure that we're all understanding each other. So when we use the term indigenous uh, on the panel, we're referring to First Nations, Métis, and Inuit peoples, the first peoples of this land. And uh, sometimes we might use older terms such as Indian, Native Canadian, or Aboriginal, but all of these terms are basically just referring to the original inhabitants of this land that we now call Canada. And Canada wouldn't exist um, without the legal agreements that were made with Indigenous peoples by the British Crown and later with the Canadian government. And that's an important thing to keep in mind as we're talking about the existence and the importance of the Indigenous Screen Office, because really the central core of Canada's history and also our identity today as a country is Indigenous. So we'll get into this uh, in more detail later, but um, historically, um, the history of filmmaking in Canada is rife with misrepresentation at best and racism at worst. So um, we're really addressing today the legacy of uh, a filmmaking that historically followed the uh, history of colonization. So um, one of the things that uh, this screen office is trying to address is that uh, still today, the majority of people who are making films with in, and screen content about indigenous peoples are non-indigenous. So this is really where the indigenous screen office comes in. 
So when we're talking about the projects that the office will likely fund, and when we talk about indigenous productions, um, we're not talking about the content, we're talking about the producers. So Telefilm just did a consultation um, with indigenous screen creators, and the working definition that they've come up with so far that um, is being used right now is that uh, two of the three key creatives in, um, in the project are indigenous, and that's producer, writer, or director, and also the control of the production is 51% or more indigenous. So it's important that we make the distinction between uh, you know, content and creators here. And um, I just wanna very quickly acknowledge the very important work that was done um, that really made the screen, the indigenous screen office possible. And um, really in this century, a huge shift started happening all over the world. Um, that indigenous creators were picking up the camera and um, really getting in front of it and controlling stories. Previously, in the last 20th century, we had um, filmmakers such as Loretta Todd, uh, Willie Dunn, Jeff Baer, Gil Cardinal, Zacharias Kunuk, and especially Alanisa Bomsawin, who's made 50 films in the past 50 years, and her latest our People Will Be Healed is screening at TIFF this year. And these were people who really blazed the way for others to follow. So there was this real momentum that built um, in the early part of the 2000s in the US, here, Australia, New Zealand, and uh, in Sami territory in Northern Europe. And alongside them, indigenous film festivals were supporting and showing this work and uh, there was a convergence of advocacy by individuals, by organizations, and uh, really all over the world. So funders started responding about 25 years ago. The Australian Screen Office formed an indigenous department. Canada Council established a separate stream for indigenous media arts creators. And the NFB was uh, heavily supporting indigenous documentary. Then more recently, the CMF um, formed a very robust fund for supporting television projects. And then in the mainstream industry, um, internationally, Sundance highlighted indigenous films starting in the 90s with their program. And um, just a, a few years ago, the Berlin International Film Festival also started a native program. And that's really changed the way the whole industry is looking at indigenous production. So it's really been an awakening to how important this diverse body of work is. And um, the part of the advocacy that was done was in writing many books and reports have been uh, commissioned over the years. One of them was uh, in 2004 by Jeff Baer at the Crossroads. And then another more recently was the Aboriginal screen-based production sector, which was commissioned by CMF, NFB, APTN, Bell, Telefilm, Canada Council, and NSI. And then another um, was commissioned by the OMDC, Telefilm, and Imaginative, Indigenous Feature Film Production in Canada. And that was by Carrie Swanson and Dana Goulet. So this is where I stop talking and give it over to Danis to really um, articulate what this report uncovered and how it really proves the need for this office. Yeah, thanks Giselle. Um, it's great to be here, everyone. Um, in 2013, I worked on a report about indigenous feature film production in Canada. Um, we were taking stock at the time and there seemed to be a robust short filmmaking <coughs> community that was making waves internationally at festivals like Berlin and Sundance and um, really putting and increasing Canada's presence at these festivals. And we were also taking stock and there seemed to be uh, quite a prolific television production community also working, mostly creating content for APTN. Um, and so we sort of were looking around and saying, well, what about feature film production? And of course, there had been enormous breakthroughs like Alanisa's entire career. Um, also, <laughs> Zacharias Canuck in 20, uh, 
2001 made Atan Arjuat the Fast Runner, which is universally regarded as the best Canadian film of all time. It won the camera door at Cannes, and it also did very well at the box office. It was one of the top grossing films of 2002. Um, so we, you know, Zacharias made that film, and we were all excited and kind of wondering why a wave of indigenous feature film production didn't follow um, the success of a film like that when it did so much um, for indigenous filmmakers, but also for Canada itself. We also looked internationally at filmmakers like Wayne Blair, who made The Sapphires. It got a 10-minute standing ovation at Cannes. It went home to Australia and did $14 million at the box office. Warwick Thornton went to Cannes as well, won the camera door, the same prize that Zacharias had won um, uh, with his film Samson and Delilah. And then we looked to New Zealand, and at the time of the report, seven of the 10 top grossing um, domestic films in New Zealand all had indigenous stories. And then, of course, Taika Waititi comes onto the scene. He makes his pinnacle film, Boy, and that film was so loved, it smashed all of the previous box office records, and um, in a country of four million people was seen by one million people. And then, Boy's record had since been broken by Taika's next film, The Hunt for the Wilda People. And, you know, with Boy, this was a film that had no name cast. It was an all-Indigenous cast, um, so all no names, and it also did incredibly well on the festival circuit. Um, so we, again, were coming back and saying, why aren't these precedent-setting films um, translating into feature film production. So we looked a little cl more closely at um, Telefilm, which is the feature film funder in Canada. And at the time that we wrote our report, we looked at a five-year period between 2008 to 2011. Telefilm funded 310 feature films, and um, five of those were indigenous, and that means indigenous made in some way, so an indigenous person in a key creative role. So that's an average of one per year. We looked also at OMDC. They funded 115 features over that time, and only one of them was an indigenous feature film. Um, so we wanted to know what this gap was, um, and so we, I under, um, took the study with Carrie Swanson. We conducted focus groups. We interviewed makers from all across the country. And the key finding of this particular um, report, and Giselle, we can roll the, um, uh, we also are gonna show some quotes sure. of it, what sure. indigenous filmmakers have said their experiences are in the industry. But the key finding that was said again and again was that there is a culture gap that must be leapt over in the industry and that indigenous filmmakers time and time again cited a lack of cultural understanding, a need to over explain the cultural context for their work and that this kind of like 101 education about the indigenous content affected all of their relationships in the industry. So with potential producing partners, broadcasters, funders, distributors, story editors, at times people were met with just indifference. At times they were told to indigenous people that their work was not Indian enough. Um, sometimes they were told they didn't believe that the films would succeed at the box office. So, you know, at Many times it was indifference, at other times it was overtly racist and ignorant. Um, so, you know, that was a real wake-up call to speak to the community of makers across Canada and understand more deeply the key barrier that Indigenous um, film and media, and this was te in television and, you know, really all of media at large, even though this particular report was just looking at feature film. Um, and so, fast forward to the summer of 2016, um, a group of um, content creators wrote a letter, 30 people from across Canada signed it, they were all Indigenous, and we asked for the establishment of an Indigenous screen office. And this letter was sent to CMF, this letter was sent to Telefilm, it was CC'd to the National Film Board of Canada, and it kicked off a process of meetings and consultation 
with telefilm and with CMF. Um, and in just last, I'll just want to say, and this has kind of been the result, like this is where we've come to. Um, but I also want to say that Telefilm responded after the consultation process and just last month announced the investment of $4.7 million in 11 new Indigenous-made feature film productions. Mm -hmm. And of course, CMF has been championing the beginning of the establishment of this office, so we can talk more about that. Okay, thank you, Dennis. I, uh, sorry, I see people looking at the quotes and shaking their heads, and you should know that these are from this week, that Giselle collected these from filmmakers this week. So uh, through my process and through Dennis's process, we heard this, but this is still very current. It's not... Yeah, so this is just a random sample, and... Um, these are by far not the worst. It's just what we, you know, a shout out a few days ago. Hey, um, do you want to share some of your quotes? Obviously, with all context removed, but because um, people still need to raise money for their next projects. But uh, it's, um, I don't think there's an indigenous uh, filmmaker in the country that hasn't heard something that could go up on this screen. Um, so, uh, and Dennis, did you want to speak a bit about the, you know, how hard it is to actually, you know, pitch a film, raise money, and the challenges as a filmmaker to just get funding, but then also have to do basic cultural education, like 101 Indigenous um, context? Yeah, I think people were expressing a lot of frustration. Um, you know, everybody knows how difficult it is to get, you know, a television series, a feature, fun, you know, any of that um, off the ground. It's very challenging for anyone. But I think a lot of the Indigenous content creators that we talked to felt as though they were almost shut down before they even got out of the gates. And so I think people were very discouraged. And also, the funding bodies in Canada represent the country, and there have been, you know, a very fraught relationship between Indigenous people in our country and institutions, especially ones that represent and receive funding from the federal government. And so I think there was also an issue of trust and, frankly, a lack of faith um, that this could really happen and that, um, creators could be supported um, in the way that they needed, uh, you know, to make, to make their projects happen. Um, I think this uh, really makes the case for why this office is so crucial. Um, so how, uh, Marcia, I wanted to ask you, like how setting up this kind of infrastructure, um, how can it resolve barriers to indigenous screen production here and maybe in other countries, like how this could potentially be a model um, that we can look to for success here in Canada and internationally? We actually did look at uh, the Screen Australia model quite closely because it's been successful for them and it's going on 25 years in existence. Acknowledging you know, the differences between countries and um, perhaps some of the goals, a lot of things that they're working on in terms of it's, it's a screen production for television, for film. Um, it is an entity within Screen Australia. Right now, what we're looking at is something that is actually a bit more independent than that. Um, how that unfolds is yet to be seen, but right now, um, it's, you know, Screen Australia is similar to Telefilm, so it's within that body, but they've had many successes, and Dennis touched on several of the filmmakers that have been successful through that. But I think through the process of engagement um, that we did last year, what we learned was that some of these barriers are probably best resolved th by ourselves, by Indigenous people, by um, whether they're barriers around, cultural barriers, which are many that you're seeing on the screen, are related to culture, but they're also um, funding barriers and just navigating the many institutions that uh, Canada has and is lucky to have to provide funding. Um, and 
I think that the partnership here is really interesting and when we get into that, but I think that the fact that all of the partners that have come to the table have expressed interest in developing more Indigenous content and don't know how to do that and are in somewhat admitting that they don't know how to do that. Who, you know, who, they don't know who the talent is to begin with. Um, so that's just as a starting point, navigating those relationships, creating better relationships with the institutions um, is an important pro st starting s step to the process. And that will be done hopefully through the office who will continue to consult with the indigenous filmmaking and, and television making community, but also with broadcasters, distributors, et cetera. Can I just jump in? Because I think I also want to say that when we looked at some of the past successes and you know the robust short filmmaking community, I think there were a couple of characteristics of what that success looked like like the things you mentioned earlier, Giselle, the Canada Council has had a dedicated Indigenous Arts Office since 1994 um, that has its own budget and it's also Indigenous, it's run by an Indigenous officer and same with Screen Australia's Indigenous Film Office which has been in existence since 1993 and also within television, CMF had actually had an indigenous production fund that at the time we wrote our report was at $7 million. So there was specific targeted funding for indigenous projects and another characteristic that seemed to um, be a marker of success was that in many times these um, budgets were controlled by indigenous people on the side of you know, commissioning, um, certainly Screen Australia um, was championed by Sally Riley, who um, led the office and really grew it in its early years. And I think there's aspects of the budget that are specific to problems that indigenous filmmakers and creators come up against, which is, you know, it's, it, there aren't a lot of language speakers. So accessing language speakers because you want to have your language, whatever that is, if it's Cree or whatnot, in your film is an expense. It's a large mm -hmm. expense. A lot of people are in remote and rural areas that don't even have appropriate access to the internet. So there's some, some barriers that, that when it comes to budgets and understanding how those are laid out, I think this is more helpful. No, that makes a lot of sense. The, um, so, Valerie, um, let's talk a bit about how the CMF got involved. Um, so, we had heard, uh, I had heard that you, um, before you were approached by Dennis and Carrie, you had already been thinking about how to get the CMF more involved in Indigenous screen production. And you wanted to bring about change and, um, like how that happened and also how you helped um, bring in some of these key funding partners that are part of the program now. Well, I always smile about that because um, I started at the CMF 10 years ago, roughly. And I think I was on the job two and a half hours when Jeff Baer called me. <laughs> and the report had been placed squarely on the center of my desk, pathway, or, uh, sorry, at the crossroads. <clears throat> so. I hadn't read it because I had just arrived. So he called and he said, so I know uh, my report's on your desk. When are you going to do something about this? So Jeff and I have had a long history over discussion about this office. But for me, that was kind of a, I guess, a trigger point, if you like. And then I had, I was in Australia for a trade mission uh, about a year after that and spent quite a bit of time talking with the Australia folks. And in the back of my mind was the question, why aren't we doing a similar kind of thing in Canada. So, you know, the years go by, and then Imaginative had an event um, which I was asked to come to, and in that room were all of the funding institutions. And the question was, what can we do about many of the things that Danis has spoken to? So I had just met with the Indigenous producers, so I didn't, didn't want to speak in that content, context at the beginning. So I listened to everybody, um, all of the great organizations, Telefilm, CBC, NFB, broadcasters were there. The room was full of the people who control money in the country. 
And many of those organizations used to have a separate program for Indigenous people. And many of those programs had collapsed. And I have to say that listening to what people said, I got very angry and very upset because the conversation was kind of like the first person who spoke said, well, I'll tell you why there aren't more Indigenous stories because making content in this country is really hard for anybody, as if to infer. And we went around the table and it was kind of like, oh God, budgets are cut, it's so tight, we just don't have the money. Yes, we used to have that program and now we don't, but it's okay because Indigenous creators can just come to the regular program. So this, went, this conversation went on and I, we had seen the trailer for Boy actually and Where the Red Fern Grows, I think <coughs> it, it's the title of that series in Australia. And both of those pieces of content took the world by surprise and the world responded and I think where the, I may be wrong about this but I think it was the highest rated broadcast audience in all of Australia for all content whether Redfern. any highest or second wow. no I was just yeah, yeah boy or red fern red fern red fern yeah. yeah so I started asking myself the questions because as Danis mentioned at the CMF, and I th I'm hoping there's staff here, because I never get the... Oh, Sandra's here, good. I think when I started the CMF in 2006, the Aboriginal program was 3 million, I believe, 2? 2 million. And then it grew, and now it's at 9? 8. Okay, see, I'm, um, you know... Good thing somebody knows what's in the program over there. Anyway, um, so I watched this, and we watched what was happening in the community, and many times it was undersubscribed. And I was always curious about that too, like why would that be? So it was really that meeting at Imaginative four years ago where at the end of that conversation, I said, okay, so nobody's got any money and we can't really do this right, but I bet you, Telefilm, you have $2 and I bet you, NFB, you've got a buck and I bet the CBC has two and we still have like five or seven. So what if we got together and started talking about instead of all these separate pieces, doing something collectively? Maybe we could look at this quite differently. And people thought that was okay as an idea, and then I think nothing happened for four years. So I phoned Danis one day, I think it was right after you'd done your report, and said, okay, so we need to figure out how to do something about this. I need somebody to come in and do a really deep consultation process across the country, a deep body of research. And she suggested Marcia. So Marcia really led the process on our behalf. We, yes, initiated it and triggered it. And along the way, you know, we kept, I kept, you know, apologized to those in the audience, badgering my counterparts. I felt that this wasn't going to make sense or work the way it should for the country of Canada unless we all got together to do it. And it's fantastic what Telefilm's done on the feature film side, and that, that's their job, and it's great. But this, to me, is something that goes a little bit beyond that and looks at content in a holistic and broad way, whether it's feature film, television, digital media, virtual reality, it doesn't matter. It's all about the content. Mm -hmm. So how do we find a way collectively to support that content? So it came out of, I think, just a growing frustration about seeing the potential of the extraordinary content makers in the country, on the feature film side, certainly on the TV side, directly with our own program, and increasingly in digital media, and how we might do this job in a better way. So bringing the partners in, people were all willing, like there was no question about that. I think as Marcia said, it wasn't a case of lack of will, it was a case of finding the path together. And I think the work that Marcia did over that year with us really built that path for us. So we've got the CMF and Telefilm and the NFB and APTN and CMPA as financial partners in this organ. Six, one more. Oh my God, CMF, Telefilm, CBC, did I say them? APTN and CMPA. <gasps> and We're NF in the CBC building, that's a really bad error. <laughs> and NFB. And NFB, okay. And, and Bell and Vice and the Harold Greenberg Fund yeah. are also program supporters. So. It's a big group of those of us in the country who've always put money into this. And I think the question becomes, you know, when you're in a colonial organization, you don't get up in the morning and think, oh, I'm gonna really do ill will today for any particular community. 
<laughs> but I think it becomes a question of you become habitually trained to look at things a certain way. And you just do things a certain way. And I don't think that works in this context. So I really believe personally, and, and the, uh, we proposed this idea to the CMF board way back before Marcia started, and there was very strong support. And it's always a question of, you know, how do you find the money? How do you do it right? How do you do all these things? But I really believe it's never a question of money, it's a question of political will. And if the organization supporting content and stories from Canada's Indigenous people can break their own barriers and look at things a different way, we might have a different kind of success. So it was a great year. It was a frustrating year. We had lots of tears and lots of laughter and lots of pounding on the table through the discussion. But I think we got somewhere, and I personally am very proud of the work everyone did over this long process to get to where we are today. Well, thank you, Valerie. So, Marcia, what does the Indigenous Screen Office look like today? <laughs> what is it going to do? How, um, how can you share with us the vision of this, uh, of what, um, what we could maybe see from the office in the future? Right now, <clears throat> it's naked. Oh. It has, um, we're, we've, we've put partnership agreements together, um, which are you know, basically memorandums to collaborate through all, all the partners that, that Val mentioned. Um, and we are currently in the process of finding the head of the office, whether that's titles an executive director or whatnot, um, to really start the next phase and shape it more. Because initially, as I said, it's going to be to work with the partners and to work with broadcasters and to work with the community itself to scope out what is required. But I think the long-term vision is quite similar to Screen Australia in that, you know, it will have components around um, training and, and building the industry itself, and that's not just for filmmakers and producers, but I think, at, or television creators, I think it's looking at how to make a more ro robust industry writ large. Um, so there'll be that component. I think there'll also be, what we're hoping is that, whether it's new funding, in all those partners that Val mentioned, you'll notice that the, the Canadian government's not been involved yet, even though Minister Jolie actually announced and is quite happy with the initiative. So I think there'll be some negotiating as well around how to make this body a bit more sustainable in the long term and build some of those programs. One of the things that Danis's report and that has been talked about uh, throughout engagement is also to create a, a feature film fund. So we heard about what Telefilm's doing, which is incredible, but I think the hope is that we begin to manage those funds, though whether it's for features, for shorts, but that that some of that funding flows through this office, um, which means setting up whatever you know. People always talk about jury processes, or do we need a board? And what's really interesting to me is because it's so independent right now, and it really has to do some r general reporting to the partners that you would do in any organization. Um, you know, that's where the accountability lies. The accountability, it's been very clear, has to also lie to the community. So figuring out what governance works to ensure that you're being accountable on both ends and able to deliver lar a large budget um, and have, you know, create some original content and be the people who are overseeing that from start to finish. I think that's what the long-term vision is, and over the next couple of years, we want to get to that point. So, but right now, we're, we're really trying to, we're hopefully going to have this staffed in the, in the next short while, and that individual will be driving. I mean, the community expressed a lot, and the reports are on the CMF website as well, if you're actually interested in, in seeing what the community said. But... Um, I think there will need to also be more discussions about as it unfolds. What is the website, Marcia? Could you tell us? The, the reports are on, on the on Canada the Media Fund website. Yeah. 
Somebody, www.cmf.fmc, is that it? Dash, fmc.ca, yeah. So, um, and Valerie, I wanted to ask you, and uh, feel free, Marcy and Dennis, if you want to jump in as well. The, um, one of the, um, you know, we can easily talk about how important this uh, screen office is culturally, politically, but um, what funders are going to be paying attention to is how, what the bottom line is. And, you know, we can maybe speak a bit about, uh, like, how there's this momentum that Dennis was describing, and that translates to real financial box office success that hasn't really been leveraged yet. So, um, uh, could you speak um, a bit about, like, how this is actually in a, a great investment, not only for the funding partners, but also for our country, like as cultural capital that we can be building with the Indigenous Screen Office? Well, I guess, I don't know how to answer that question exactly, except to say that the content is there. Mm -hmm. The writers, the directors, the stories, the ideas are there. You don't know if that's gonna succeed in the box office till you get it made. And you saw all the quotes. And these, you know, what, what we've come across in people I talk to in the community, these stories aren't all about residential schools. Some are, of course. But there's a wealth of stories. There's drama, there's comedy, there's horror. There's a whole whack of creative intensity. And unless you can allow those stories to get developed, get produced, and be in the market, if I knew what a box office success would look like in anything, I probably wouldn't be sitting in this chair because none of us can predict that. But you can look to many of the examples around the world that Dan has mentioned. And when those, when the content, great content is great content. And I think the world and people and audiences and Canada will respond to that. It's actually what I said at that meeting four years ago. It's the people who are missing out because we haven't done this to the best of our ability are the Canadian and the world public because I, our stories from this community are here. There's no question about that. So of course there's going to be challenges. You can always find a million reasons why something won't work. My question is, is what are the solutions to those obstacles? Sure, you've got funding issues, structural issues, government-related issues in terms of, you know, us, Telefilm, the NFB, but those are just current structural issues that we have to remove the, the habit and fear of just saying, oh, well, we can't do this because of this. Of course you can do it. You just have to find a way to do it. So I think, as Marcia said, you know, this person who's going to, to leverage all of this work and build this office, uh, boy, um, this is what, like, a saint or some, I don't know what you'd call it, but it's somebody who has to be diplomatic, do all the negotiations, and actually build some of those outcomes and targets that make sense for this content. So I think there is, there's, if you want to call it a business model, it seems kind of an odd phrase to refer to it to, but it's about unleashing the power of this content on the world, and that will find its way to market is my own belief. And one thing that keeps coming up, like from the quotes, from all of the reports, from the books, the many books now that have been written on this topic is how um, mainstream industry funders still today, after the TRC has released its findings, still today in uh, 2017, are um, many of the people in positions of power controlling the money still have no idea they're very unaware of an internalized colonial attitude that sets up a real barrier to any indigenous um, screen producer that's coming to try and access funding. So, you know, it seems like it might be a very uh, impossible task to all of a sudden have everybody in the mainstream film industry be aware, but you know, the solution is this office because yeah. then you bypass that colonial attitude. But you know what we saw during this last year of discussion was almost a complete upside down of the meeting four or five years ago, wouldn't you say? Like people were really at the table, seriously, and starting to recognize some of the very things you just mentioned. And I think, I think this is an opportunity to, to break that and to, to sort of start for each individual 
in a position of power, controlling money, to start to identify that internalized thinking. And just f like words, attitudes, beliefs, simple things, big things, complex things. But I certainly saw a very different group of people, and some of them were the same individuals who said some of those same comments four years ago in this process that was really encouraging. Marcia might want to have something to say about yeah. that. I don't know. <laughs> she kept mentioning it to me. This is really different. Yeah. Well, I think it, I, we've talked about why now and why it's been successful now, but I think there's been a bit of a perfect storm in terms of what's going on politically in the country um, and the whole context of reconciliation how successful our filmmakers have been and uh, the call even for diversity in the past year. I mean, when I, when I started this process, the big headline was Oscars so white. So all I've heard about is how bad that is and how there needs to be diversity. It's really difficult to argue against something that's going to bring that into fruition. So. Um, I think there have been a lot of things that have come together to make the timing of this uh, work. And as Val said, some of the partners, you know, come, it's coming off of the Truth and Reconciliation um, at calls to action, the NFB ha and, and this report and that engagement process, the NFB started looking quite seriously at their own processes and their own, I mean, they framed it as looking at their own biases, so, mm -hmm. and, and revisiting how they've helped perpetuate stereotypes. Mm -hmm. That's a huge thing for an institution to openly do, and um, so, you know, a lot of the partners um, are, are, may not know exactly how they can contribute at this point. They just know they want to be part of the conversation. They know that they want to have access to this talent. They know that, so it, I think the office, I think the industry has grown for us, especially in the country, and I think that the office is the logical next step and it's gonna help pro propel and project things even further. Yeah, I think it's really important that um, when we're thinking about, because I think when people think about colonization, they think about the theft of um, land and culture and language, but it also includes the theft of our stories. And so championing indigenous filmmakers in key creative roles is really, you know, the way forward. And I'm just so encouraged. I think this has been an incredible year. And I just want to take the opportunity to thank you, Valerie, for sharing in this vision. It's really promising. And the other funders that have come to the table as well that are, you know, pushing this forward. Yeah, thank you, Valerie. Um, now let's uh, open this up to questions. Um, I'm sure some of you have uh, questions you'd like to ask our panelists. We're going to have volunteers come to you with a microphone so everybody can hear your question. Uh, hello, uh, my name is Brennan. I'm a Métis filmmaker from Toronto. And I had a question about, uh, it was touched on a little bit, I think, uh, during the talk but I was wondering how uh, you were going to fight um, sort of tokenism in the selection process. Because as we saw on, on the fronts, like sometimes filmmakers are told that their films aren't native enough or they aren't telling native enough stories. So um, is there any way that you could uh, talk about that? Of course there needs to be native stories on screen, but it seems like sometimes if things aren't native enough, then they're trying to fit a certain quota of Wh sorry, which selection process, just to be clear? Uh, like, selection process for what gets funded. Mm. By the Indigenous Screen Office, you mean? Uh, yeah, or, or other uh, Indigenous, um, like, funding grants around the country. That's sort of... Yeah, I'm not, I mean, uh, the other funders around the country are starting to look at things as, as was mentioned, I think, by Giselle earlier, around what it means to be an Indigenous production, which is very clear and very Indigenous. Um, I think two out of three key creatives is a really strong position. So um, in terms of for the office, uh, like I said, I think those processes are just being figured out. But I, I, it's funny, I've not even thought of the word token. I, I feel like this, uh, creating this office just reverses that whole concept in and of itself. Um, but you know, I've, I have heard issues from people over the past year, even around 
you know, having juries is not necessarily an indigenous aspect of governance. So looking at what would work um, in terms of selection and what the what upholds some of the values and principles that we put into how we want this office to operate as an indigenous run office. We created a set of, of values and, and things like that. So ensuring that those are in place in whatever process is developed, I think that's that's gonna be how the office addresses it. How others yeah, do? I, the, that I would agree with Marcy. I think this is the reverse of tokenism. I mean, at the CMF, we're still required for anything we finance has to have a broadcast license in Canada. And the majority broadcaster on the Aboriginal program at the CMF has been APTN, although CBC has also licensed, as has um, Bell and others. But, you know, we're hopeful that that requirement will be... Um, adjusted, shall we say, in the future, so that there's a little more flexibility and freedom. But I don't think, you know, if you look at the, and they're all on the website, if you look at what's been created as value statements for the office, I think you'll be reassured that tokenism isn't in there. And were you, were you talking about content? Because yeah. this is all about creators. So this is like, the film could be about Japanese skateboarders in Tokyo. Yeah. If it's an indigenous writer and director, yeah, if it's a good yes. story, it's going to be funded. Yeah, it's going to be separate from Yeah. Okay. Okay. And question over here. The volunteer will just come over. Hi, my, na my name is Geraldine. Congratulations, everyone. Um, a question is for behind the camera, for creating opportunities for Indigenous people in writing rooms, and particularly women directors and behind the scenes. Is that something you see yourselves being able to establish credits and incentives for not only Indigenous films, but opportunities for other filmmakers to be very inclusive? Is that something perhaps you're doing or is already out there? Because that's something I'm very interested in doing. Screenwriting was one of the, one of the key pieces that came up throughout engagement. Um, I think in terms of where there's a lack now or what, what is needed in terms of training or development, production was one end and, and screenwriting was another. Um, and there have been some emerging programs uh, dealing with screenwriting. I'm looking at one of the women who's, who's ran it for, Imagine Native has started a, a screenwriting program a year or two ago. I'm really terrible with dates. Um, but that was one of the key pieces. So when we were looking at these other partners like Vice, like Carol Greenberg and Bell, how we'd like to see them contributing is by creating mentorships or the labs and, and working with the office to, to do the type of thing you're talking about. So that's exactly, I think the, the key ones we've looked at initially were screenwriting and production where we needed some of that, uh, that development initially. Okay, and a uh, question right here. Right here in the front row, the inside seat. Hi. When I came in, I didn't know what indigenous means, uh, but I have a screenplay for feature for indigenous ready. Whom should I hand it to? <laughs> um, so, we're talking about Indigenous creators. Are you an Indigenous writer, director, or producer? I'm not in Indigenous myself, but uh, I have a screenplay, which I think is a great one. It just has, it needs to be translated, but after it's translated, whom should I hand it to, to see if they want to make it? Probably not this office, <laughs> because you would probably go to the regular mainstream funding industry because you're not an indigenous creator. Um, historically, most stories still about indigenous issues, characters, are still being made by non-indigenous filmmakers, and that's um, nobody's saying that that should stop altogether. But what this office is trying to do is make sure that... Um, indigenous creators tell their own stories with a very strong voice and then eventually the majority of those stories will be told by the people uh, from the communities. Yes, based on my understanding, 
what you're saying was more than 51 percent like other people they could get involved in yeah if you, if you um find indigenous uh director producer uh who'd like to work with you and um their production company controls the production your project would be I um, understand. Welcome to apply to this office. Can I get connected with them through this? Yes, to go to the Imaginative well, Film and Media Arts Festival, which happens every October. It's the largest Indigenous film festival in the world, and it's here in Toronto. Thank you. The 18th to 21st of October. Thanks for the plug, Dan. Okay, and another question. Somewhere in the back, a shy person, perhaps. Yep. You don't look very shy. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, my name is Mike McMillan, and I'm a, a producer here in, um, in Toronto. Um, I have a very nuts and bolts question. I'm sorry, I should have just asked this from you guys afterwards, which is, um, how does it work the two out of three? I think it's a fantastic idea. Um, how does it work in the instance where, for example, you have two producers, maybe one is Caucasian, one is not, how does that count inside the points? That's very me-oriented. Um, the other one too, and I'll try to not call anybody out, I'm just wondering if you guys have opinions. I feel like there are uh, maybe two or three sort of large-scale projects that are based on indigenous story, but do not include indigenous creators right now that are coming out. Um, I'm wondering if you guys are planning on maybe using those as examples of sort of a learning experience for all of us so that we can get a better understanding of it. Um, again, not calling out any names, but there are a couple of projects that I've had conversations with people and I just was like, holy crap, are you tone deaf? Like, are you not listening to what is happening right now? Um, and uh, even on a project that I'm working on right now, very early on I started walking down the wrong path and somebody very politely took me aside and was like, that's going to fail. So I was like, oh, great. So um, I wonder if maybe you could talk a little bit about, again, without calling those projects out, because I don't, I don't want to be an asshole, but it would be great to hear what your, uh, your opinions or perspectives are on some of those, especially those sort of features that we know are sort of in that five to 10 mil range. Thanks for bringing that up, and thanks for listening when you were called out. <laughs> um, Marcia, do you want to address that? Um, I... I'm not going to speak to those in production because I think that that we, you know, that's just exactly what we're trying to address through this office. But one piece that you obviously had responded to and that that Imaginative is putting together right now or is, is beginning to work on is called uh, Pathways and Protocols. So it is for non-Indigenous and Indigenous uh, content creators who want to work on Indigenous themes in Indigenous communities um, on Indigenous topics and what the appropriate cultural protocols would be for that in any given community across the country. And that is also premised on something that's been done in Australia. And at this point, you know, uh, Imaginative's just starting the, the consultation process for that, and hopefully within a year, you know, there'll be something in place that this office can use to help work with, with non-Indigenous filmmakers, but Indigenous filmmakers as well. Um, all that to say, uh, you know, and I'm not saying this is the goal, but it's something to keep in mind. In Australia, when Screen Australia funds any production that has any Indigenous content or reference or person, that, and they're giving the funding uh, from Screen Australia, you have to follow the same type of document. You have to look at this pathway, pathways and protocols and have followed that in order to receive public funding. So, I mean, if I had my own vision, that would be what happens. I know that scares many, many, many producers, and it's a longer discussion, and it's a longer development, but it's in the hopes to address some of the issues that you just brought up. Yeah, I wanna say that due to the history of misrepresentation and underrepresentation of indigenous stories, that continues to this day. So we talk about it historically, but it's actually still happening. So to any non-indigenous creators that are interested in indigenous stories, you know, you have to come into this with a lot of humility and with a lot of respect. In some ways, it is walking reconciliation in action. And people think that reconciliation is, you know, where you get to jump ahead to the fire and all sing Kumbaya together. <coughs> but reconciliation is actually very tough 
work. It cre um, it's uncomfortable, um, and a lot of times people come into this space and they have no idea about the political tripwires that they're just walking all over without having any clue. So hopefully something like Pathways and Protocols can create a guide. It's not meant to impose, it is meant to be a resource. Thank you for that, Dennis. We're going to have to stop there, but that seems like a really great place to stop. And I just want to thank Valerie, Dennis, Marcia for all of the advocacy and work that you and so many others have done and for speaking with us today. And for those of you who are here today and um, especially those of you who are engaged in this dialogue, thank you very much. Thank you all so much, really appreciate it. Our next session is at three o'clock. It's our Guardian TIFF Talks with the film team, Call Me By Your Name. So we will see you at three o'clock. Thank you.